Hello, my name is Didier Reinhardt. I work at the Hoogent University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Ghent, Belgium. In 2005, my position in the field of children's rights shifted when I started working at the Children's Rights Center of Ghent University. From a practitioner in the children's rights field, I then became a researcher of children's rights. In 2012, I completed my PhD on the children's rights movement in Flanders, Belgium. It is based on these experiences that my critical perspective on children's rights slowly took shape and it's until today still work in progress. I certainly do not consider my critical perspective on children's rights as a clear and fully developed approach. Rather, it's more like a number of principles that determine my view on children's rights. My critical approach on children's rights starts from a couple of observations I did and I still do in the field of children's rights today. Observations that I, to a certain extent, consider as problematic. A first observation is a consideration that rights, and children's rights in particular, are dominantly understood in a legal way, risking of ending up in an over juridification of children's rights. A merely legal perspective on rights can end in dichotomized social relations, highlighting the individual interests of those people involved, mostly children and parents, but can also be other educators, of course. Especially in educational relationships, this can give ground to an increased level of conflict when the interests of children become opposed to the interests of parents or other educators. In addition, legal standards are never neutral. They always reflect in one way or another the interest of a particular group, dominant group in society or they are used in a social climate that gives a specific interpretation to these legal rules. Interpretations that might risk to ignore the educational circumstances in which children grow up and in which children's rights have to be realized. These circumstances are often very diverse and characterized by the combination of several social conditions. Not only age, but also ethnic, economic, or religious backgrounds play an important role in the way children's rights are constructed. Specific attention for these concrete educational circumstances risk to shift out of sight, with children's rights being understood as a set of objective values, ignoring context. I think there is much more to say about legal translation of rights, but at least these two elements are of fundamental importance, I think. A second observation is related to the childhood image underlying the framework of children's rights. Over the past decades, children became increasingly considered as co-constructors of their own life, criticizing two paternalistic claims on children from adults and from educational institutions. The alternative childhood image claimed by children's rights organizations can be grasped by the idea of the autonomous child, as opposed to the until then dominant conception of the incompetent child. The former emphasizes the full citizenship status of children and rejects the normalization paradigm of adulthood of the latter. However, dominant interpretations of the concept of autonomy for children assume a view on childhood where children are expected to act in society as responsible and accountable citizens. This presupposes a homogeneous view on the group of children where children are all expected to behave as autonomous children. This is an essentialist assumption of autonomy that does not take into consideration the great diversity of children as well as a huge diversity in context in which children grow up. Likewise, it ignores the question of which resources children have at their disposal to reach the ideal of an autonomous human being. Difference that exists under children, based again, as in the previous part, on ethical, cultural, historical, social, economic, or religious backgrounds, might be ignored, although they might have a larger impact than the effect of age has on being considered as responsible. In addition, when the childhood image of the autonomous child is introduced in child rearing, it risks to be used as a criterion or ruler to measure situations or individual characteristics. This results in groups of children who meet these standards, 
but creates at the same time groups of children who do not meet these standards. When not realizing the expectations that go together with the necessity of the good citizen, children can be held responsible for what goes wrong in education. Also here, when focusing on the individual responsibility of children and young people, social conditions under which children grow up that have an impact on taking responsibility threaten to disappear out of sight. A third observation concerns the often very technical approach to children's rights. Scholars in the field of children's rights have been mainly involved in positivist, legal positivist frameworks by some defined as the global children's rights industry. This refers to the enormous amount of literature concerned with standard setting, implementation and monitoring children's rights, also often referred to as the so-called Geneva scene. The focus on this triptych of standard setting, implementation, monitoring suggests that children's rights in the global children's rights industry are not under discussion. It seems that, especially as a consequence of the adoption of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, children's rights have got bogged down in a consensus thinking. This risk to narrow children's rights into a technocratic discourse that no longer addresses the meaning of children's rights. Children's rights are then presented as a new norm in policy and practice without questioning or problematizing this new norm. The debate on children's rights then becomes a technical debate on the most effective, the most efficient way to implement children's rights and how best to monitor this implementation. This is preeminently a positivistic representation of children's rights. The consensus thinking in children's rights that lies at the heart of this technicalization has closed the debate on children's rights. However, children's rights might be less unambiguous and more discordant than generally assumed. Closely linked with the technicalization of children's rights is its decontextualization. Metaphysical abstractions of children's rights, such as the autonomous individual embedded in Western philosophy of liberal individualism and the concept of the autonomous child, fail to engage with the specific conditions and context in which children live. So children, children's rights operate in a society with many different interests, different visions, power relations, and in very different contexts with very different histories and different living conditions. It is within this context that children's rights should be understood as a contested terrain. To properly understand this contextuality, I make use of the tradition of phenomenology. Phenomenology can be considered as an umbrella concept for very different but nevertheless related approaches. In general, it is a philosophical approach strongly developed in the past century in continental Europe by people such as Edmond Roussel, Martin Heidegger, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Jean-Paul Sartre, Emmanuel Levinas, and there are many others. What they all have in common is that they oppose a certain epistemological foundation of the world and of humanity, one that emanates from scientific objectivism. This was a clear critique to natural sciences who are looking for general applicable laws of nature. Instead, phenomenology is an approach to studying and understanding human lived everyday experience of a phenomenon. From the point of view of lived everyday experiences, reality is always connected with human experience. It is a constructed reality made by people. If we want to understand the phenomenon at stake, then we have to study it in the context where it belongs. So applied to children's rights, that means that children's rights cannot be understood in their legal translations, but should be understood in the life worlds of people where they are shaped by children, parents, and other stakeholders in interaction between people and their surrounding contexts. How children's rights are constructed, what they really mean for children, parents, and other stakeholders can only arise from everyday lived experiences. In the field of social work, that is my background, phenomenology has a quite well-developed approach in educational sciences with a long-standing tradition of scholars doing phenomenological research. However, in recent years, it faded into the background, but it lives on in more anthropological and life-world approaches.
Coming back to the concept of life world, that is indeed a very important notion in my critical perspective on children's rights. How I understand this concept is partly inspired by the work of Jürgen Habermas, who distinguished the practical rationality of the life world from the instrumental rationality of the system, arguing that in modern societies, the life world has been colonized by instrumental rationality. This is in line with the observations I made earlier in this presentation of dominant legal perspective in the field of children's rights that risk to colonize the life world of children. Particularly in social work, people like Klaus Grunwald and Hans Diersch have further developed this life world orientation, explaining that it uses the issues, crises, and experiences with service users' life world situation as a reference point. Also here, the starting point to think about children's rights are not the legal translations of rights in, for instance, the UNCRC, but instead the daily life conditions of children, parents, and so on. Also, Jim Ive, an Australian scholar in social work, stated that in the broader field of human rights, it is about ordinary people constructing and reconstructing ideas of human rights in their day-to-day -day lives. A life world perspective might seem to be very much micro-oriented, not taking into account more structural traits of society. And this is indeed a critique that inspired some scholars to take a more broad point of view in phenomenological studies. And so structural traditions in phenomenology can be considered as complementing or even opposing more individual traditions. Indeed, personal meaning-making of an individual needs to be understood in the complex interplay with social, political, cultural, and historical traits of context. This is also what Edmund Roussel explained when stating that the life world is both subject relative and generally structured. So each person has its own subjective life world, but at the same time, through intersubjective experience, people constitute their common life world, consisting of prevailing structures. History then can be considered as one such an important collectively constructed experience, and therefore extremely important to take into account when trying to understand children's rights, although it is often ignored. As the German social pedagogue Klaus Mollenhauer showed us, practices of, in my case, in my research, practice of children's rights, explicitly, but far more implicitly, bears elements referring to historical processes. These elements often remain hidden and therefore cannot be taken into account to fully understand a contextual view of children's rights. In my critical perspective on children's rights, I pay a lot of attention on how children's rights are historically constructed. However, this does not imply any form of historical determinism. If we aim to understand how children's rights emerged and developed in Belgium, for instance, we need to turn, out, to turn our focus on the domain of youth care, as it was in this domain that for the first time a claim was articulated in terms of children's rights. This was done by civil society organizations who acted against paternalist state power. It resulted in alternative forms of youth care and laid the foundation for the development of new national legal frameworks incorporating children's rights. This all happened in what is called a conservative welfare regime, having a certain tradition with social rights and is often characterized by balancing civil society's interest and state power. There is obviously much more to say about these um, historical characteristics. The central focus here is structural accounts, such as history or a welfare regime, are important elements in phenomenology. Scholarly work in the field of children's rights, from a phenomenological point of view, therefore, should much more take into account the importance of local historiographies of children's rights, trying to understand children's rights in relation to a particular welfare regime of a country. The link to welfare regimes on the one hand and the role of civil society on the other hand brings me to another important characteristic for my critical approach on children's rights, that is social movement studies. Indeed, if we wish to understand children's rights from below, constructed from the life world of children themselves, then the work of social movements, grassroots movements cannot be ignored. 
Inspired by Nancy Fraser, I consider social movements as counter-public spheres, spaces to challenge what we know. They are places where we can construct new definitions of injustice, equality, and rights. It are spaces for thinking new thoughts, activating new actors, generating new ideas. Spaces to challenge common sense based on debate, forming new symbols, struggle over values and visions of how life should be lived. Particularly the so-called new social movements from the 1960s with their focus on a broad range of social and political concerns related to the identity dimension, such as age, highlighted groups in society that were marginalized from social inclusion in the post-war welfare state settlement. New social movements indeed challenge the welfare state on neglecting contemporary societal issues. The societal position was one such an issue that was generally neglected in the welfare state. Children's rights organizations, the children's rights movement, they made claims and expressed particularly the challenge to unbalanced power relations between children and adults, parents in particular. These claims came from below, from grassroots organizations. As said before, in Belgium, for instance, alternative youth care practices emerged, taking into account the participation rights of children. These practices, at a later stage, were institutionalized within the framework of the welfare state. But the work of the social movement, such as the children's rights movement, cannot be underestimated in constructing children's rights from a life world perspective. Although also here there is much more to say about the role of social, social movements in terms of children's rights, including some critiques related to, for instance, representational power or institutionalization, social movements and more particular maybe grassroots movements play a very important role in constructing children's rights from below, from the life world of people. So both phenomenology and in particular phenomenology that takes into account structural issues in society on the one hand and social movement studies on the other hand give inspiration for a critical perspective on children's rights. This critical perspective is characterized by the following presumptions. The first one is that children's rights are social constructions. They are permanently constructed, deconstructed and reconstructed in the life worlds of people of children, of parents, and other educators. Children's rights should be understood from everyday experience of people, including children. Second, social constructions of children's rights should be understood in the complex interplay of social, political, cultural, and historical traits of a context. Social constructions of children's rights are embedded in the welfare regime, the welfare state of a country. And third, Children's rights are discursive. Their meaning is ambiguous and varies according to place, time, person, and context. There is a persistent myth in children's rights scholarship that children's rights-based practices de facto result in fairer and more just life situation for children. We have to at least question this point of view. So children's rights should be considered as a contested terrain with no one unique path in understanding or constructing children's rights. A process of permanent critique, understood as the practice of questioning and analyzing presuppositions underlying constructions of children's rights, is imperative to avoid an understanding of children's rights as truths. Thank you very much. <laughs>